Now that you have a good mastery of the discounted cash flow valuation methods, we also want to introduce you to other valuation methods. Um, these methods are oftentimes referred to as multiples methods. The um, rationale behind this type of approach is that we can evaluate the price of a stock relative to other stocks. Um, the general principle of this approach um, follows the law of one price. So if the market is sufficient, then the, then um, all the asset in the market should sell at the same price. Um, the, the challenge there, of course, is we know that a stock is not a commodity. So um, it's difficult to then decide what is the central key characteristic of a stock that make it uh, that makes the price um, uniform. So to take a look at an example, if you are buying jeans and all that you care is a piece uh, a pair of jeans that fits you, um, you can buy a commodity pair of jeans and um, it doesn't matter whether the pair of jeans comes from Sears, Walmart, Target, and you can and those store brand quote unquote would typically sell at the same price because they are um their only characteristic that you care about is that is a pair of jeans that's blue and fits you uh however once you add other characteristics such as design and materials um name brand then of course the price won't be the same so similar case for a stock um, what is the one single characteristic that is important about a stock to an investor as we saw earlier, um, there are actually three. Um, one is the size of the cash flow, the timing of the cash flow, and the risk associated with the cash flows. So the multiples method um, doesn't really address all three of those. Um, instead, they try to identify a key, matrix, a key metric, and oftentimes the multiple is based on one of those. Um, so the downside of the multiples method is not that it's a relative valuation method, but more that um, the problem may be the performance metric that is chosen does not capture all the important characteristics of a stock. Um, let's take a look at an example. The most common uh, multiple is perhaps the PE ratio. Uh, PE ratio also stands for price earnings ratio. And the metric, the performance metric that this ratio is based on is the earnings per share. Um, so if you want to use this as the metric and this as the multiple to estimate the price of a stock, you simply take the earnings per share from that particular stock, multiply that by the PE ratio of a peer group of companies. So a peer group of company is company that you believe has share other similar characteristics. Um, it sounds reasonable and as I said, this, this, this approach is used very common um, in the industry. The downside is about earnings per share. Um, what is the quality of this matrix? Um, is it easy? Uh, do firms have control over this number? Is this number reliable? And um, that is a topic that we'll discuss later when we look at the financial statements. So accounting and finance are related uh, primarily because a lot of the information that finance analysts use to, to study a company is based on um, financial records that is created by accountants. So if there are um, limitations to the amount of information that is provided by the earnings per share, uh, those limits can greatly um, interfere with the ability to value a stock using earnings per share as a key performance matrix. Um, so the advantages of this method is that it is relatively straightforward to apply and it um, and if the metric is chosen correctly or is the metric itself is reliable and provides sufficient information, it is useful. Uh, the downside is that oftentimes we may have problem with those metrics. Um, there are other popular multiples includes the PE ratio, the price to sales ratio. So instead of looking at earnings, which is the income from the to the company, we look at the revenue, which is sales. Um, Another one is market to book. Book here refers to the book value. So this is the market price to the book value per share of the stock. 
Um, all these are common multiples and this approach again has no limits. So the, if a new metric becomes important um, during the dot-com boom and the internet bubble of the 2000s, uh, companies that are not generating earnings, companies that are not even generating sales have market value. And so how do you value those companies? So new multiples were being created, will have price to click ratio, price per impression ratio. So the, the idea there is to find a way to value a firm relative to its peers. Um, and of course, the downside of multiples method is that if there's a bubble and all the stocks are overvalued, then this method will not tell you that the market is overvalued at that point in time. Now that you have a, a good understanding of two different types of valuation method, next we turn to the idea of um, the required return. The required return is an important um, variable and oftentimes used in other contexts such as uh, finding the discount rate for other companies and also um, later on in using it as a uh, as a required return when we evaluate projects. Uh, so the constant growth model is one of the methods that we can use to estimate the required return. So the constant growth model is a um, growing perpetuity. So we can rearrange this. Um, we can go through the algebra for that. So to rearrange this, the first step we can do is to cross multiply. So we have the required return is equal to um, the required return minus the growth rate is equal to the dividend in year one divided by the price in year zero. Next, we just simply add the growth rate to both sides. So this cancel out and we have the required return is the dividend in year one divided by the price plus the growth rate. So we have these two terms here. The first term, dividend in year one divided by the price in year zero is the dividend yield. So this is similar to the current yield um, in bond valuation. So what that what is important about this is this is a recurring return. So this is the uh, each year, as long as you hold on to the stock, you'll earn the dividend yield. The second part is the constant growth rate. In the constant growth model, this the, the growth rate is very interesting. In the constant growth model, this growth rate is actually equal to the capital gains yield. So this is how much the price of the stock will increase by. So this is true only in the constant growth model, but it's very um, useful as a concept to recognize that there's two components to the return. The first component is the income component, and the second component is a capital gains component. To help us better understand this, let's go through an example. Let's say you have a stock that is currently selling for ten fifty, and they just pay the dividend of a dollar, and they expect that dividend will grow at five percent per year. We are asked to find the required return. So first and very important is identify which model does this firm fit under. We know that um, dividend is expected to grow at five percent per year with no qualifier. So we can assume that the dividend will continue to grow at this rate. So the first thing we have to establish is that yes, this company fits the constant growth model because it's only, it only has one growth rate and it will last forever. So we know that the growth rate is 5%. The price today, that's relatively easy, is $10.50. We have a $1 dividend. So this and we need to decide what year dividend this belong to. Um, the fact that this was just paid, so past tense, tells us that this, is, this was dividend in year zero. So our first task in order to use the constant growth model, which um, you should have written down, the constant growth model says that the required return is the dividend yield, dividend divided by price in year zero, plus the constant growth rate. So in order to use this model, we need dividend in year one. We have dividend in year zero. We can find dividend in year one because we know that dividend in year one is the $1 and it will grow by 5% because our growth rate is 5%. So dividend in year one is $1.05. So we have 
five is our dividend year one, and our price today is ten dollars and fifty cents, and our growth rate is five percent. So we can find uh we can find out what the total required return is. So a dollar five divided by ten fifty is point one and plus 0.05. So what that tells us is that the dividend yield is 10% and the capital gains yield or the growth rate is 5%. So altogether the required return for this firm is 15%.